Morning. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before I begin with my um, talk this morning, I wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, first of all, thank uh, Mrs. Lori Martin as well as her husband, Dr. Lori Martin. Thank you for hosting uh, today's program, yesterday's program. I, I think I'm not sure, and any other programming, and uh, specifically Eli Nishmas. Sarit Martin, Allah Shalom, Sariuta, uh, Bas, Ephraim, Menachem, Mendel, Bedina, Shayyim. So, uh, really, I want to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to be here. And um, I was hoping this morning, if I could, you know, when I, when I spoke to Rabbits and Fuchs initially about coming today, uh, I don't think anybody really understood the deeper context, the broader context of what would be going on in the world. Uh, at the time of my presentation. And so, while the content itself is not going to change, I'm hopeful that the message that we're able to draw will be able to make connections to a very challenging circumstance that certainly all of us are well aware of and deeply troubled by. And um, considering the fact that the natural reaction uh, for most people is, well, I'm, I'm troubled, I want to see change, and what can I do about it? So hopefully, at least as it relates to that last category, maybe through not only our learning, uh, but also with specific outcomes that we're able to draw from today's conversation, we'll be able to do something about it that will be meaningful, that we'll feel that we're making a connection. Even if we don't see it on the proverbial battlefield, we can know deep down that we at least, as far as who we are, what we're able to accomplish, have made a difference. And I think that that's always important to keep in mind. Uh, just a couple of technical points before we start. As it was mentioned, there is a handout um, some of you have it in one page, some of you may have it in two. Uh, the content, I believe, is all the same. I didn't inspect each page, but my understanding is that you all have the same thing. It is all primary sources and all in Hebrew, some of it actually in Aramaic, and so I will be translating. Okay. Um, so hopefully everybody should be able to follow along and there really aren't uh, any concerns in that regard. Um, as far as, I don't know what the normal standard is with regards to raising you know, hands, asking questions, things like that. Uh, for now, I'm going to ask that we try to get into it, especially because we're starting a drop behind schedule. I don't know if we have a firm 11 o'clock in time, but if we do, then we really need to be moving. Um, and then if you can just jot down your questions or comments for afterwards, and if time permits, we'll get to them. Okay? All right, so uh, again, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, let's jump right into the fact that we know that the three weeks are historically a very difficult time. And as I mentioned before, we're dealing with another challenge. And as I was thinking about it yesterday, <coughs> the fact that we have this challenge that sort of intercepts with the, uh, with the three weeks and specifically with the nine days is a little bit concerning more so because we all know historically we've had many challenges at this time. So let's take a look at the Mishnah in Tanis, which tells us, Chamisha Devarim Iru Es Avoseinu B'Shiva Asa B'Tamuz, the Chamisha B'Tishiva. Historically, and this of course only covers through the period of the Mishnah. The Mishnah was, was edited and finalized roughly around the year 200 of the Common Era. So about 1800 years ago, a little bit less. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi organized all of the Tanaitic teachings of previous generations, and these five historic occurrences for each date were already in place at that time. The five that occurred on Shavasa Batamas, number one, Mishtabru Haluchos. The Luchos, the tablets, were destroyed. Number two, Ubitel Hatamid, the daily sacrifice that was part and parcel of the core of Oda and the Beis Amikdash. That had stopped. The Gemara talks about the siege around Yushalayim. They had run out of animals. It was quite a difficult um, component, and we don't really appreciate that because, of course, we don't have this notion of a tummit as part of our uh, daily tefillah, except for if you say kerbanos, and even then, of course, we don't associate it in the same type of way. Number three, the huf ha'ir, probably the one that we are most commonly connected to when we think about Shabbat Sabatamos, that the walls of the city of Yerushalayim were breached. Now, historically, we're referring to uh, by shame. Okay, because by its Rishon, they actually were breached about a week or so prior on the 9th of Av. It's a historical nuance. I'm not sure that it makes that much of a difference. And usually we say that we follow the more current, like the present suffering, the present mourning. Meaning to say that there were two disruptions. Right? There was a disruption of the first base of Mikdash, depending on which historical system you, you adopt. 
either occurred in 586 before the Common Era or 423 roughly before the Common Era, different opinions depending on what you do with the Persian Era, which is a totally different conversation we can't get into. But there was a 70 year gap between Bias Rishon and Bias Shani, which that is also not so simple, but certainly when Bias Rishani was rebuilt, it lasted according to the Gemara for 420 years and it was destroyed according to most opinions in the year 70. And that's the destruction that we're referring to. Number four, the Sarah Apustamas Esatora, the Hemid Selim Behechel, two other not insignificant, but perhaps not on the same level, some of what we mentioned before, the burning of a sacred Torah, as well as the erection of an idol in the, in the Hechal. Those items occurred as well during, I believe, period of Bayashani. And for those five reasons, with the particular focus on the breaching of the walls of Yerushalayim, we fast on the 17th of Tammuz, and the 17th of Thomas begins what we call the three-week period, which of course is a period of reduced, uh, of increased mourning and reduced happiness, okay? Now, um, the five that occurred pertaining to Tisha B'Av, which of course is scheduled, hopefully it should be a day of, of redemption, but it's presently scheduled uh, for next, oh, it's gonna happen regardless, but it's uh, coming up soon. The Tisha B'Av, Nizar Alavosinu Shalo Yitnis Sularitz. The first one is, and this is a very significant one, this was the day on which our forefathers were decreed not to enter into the land of Israel, referring to the generation that ultimately died in the desert. We'll talk about that a little more in a little bit. Number two, v'charav habayis barishona ubashnia. Both Batei Mikdash, both temples in Yerushalayim were destroyed. The Nilkida Beitar, the city of Beitar, which was made famous by the forces of Bar Kokhba, you might be familiar that Bar Kokhba lived a, a, around 80 years after the destruction of the second base of Mikdash, and he led a rebellion that <coughs> climaxed roughly in the years 132 to 135, when he was struggling with Hadrian, the Roman Empire emperor at the time, who had initially promised to help the Jews rebuild the base of Mikdash, ultimately reneged on his promise, and not only that, but went full out against the Jewish people at that time with a, a series of very, very strong anti-Jewish, anti-Torah decrees. And the, the, the revolt of, of, of Bar Kokhba was designed to overthrow Hadrian and to reestablish Jewish autonomy in, in Eretz Yisrael. It ultimately resulted in a terrible destruction of Jewish forces in the city of Beitar. The Gemara describes how much blood was flowing to the point that describes how the, the horses of the Roman soldiers were wallowing were in, 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 this, in this river of, of blood. It's a difficult scene to imagine and certainly to, to, to internalize, but nonetheless, that's how the Gemara presents it. And then finally, V'nech Roshah and the city was plowed. You might be familiar with the story with Rabbi Akiva at the end of Makos. It's a fascinating story. We don't have really much time for it, but there you see the power of positive thinking and how Rabbi Akiva was able to say that in the midst of despair, there's the opportunity and promise for redemption, which is a beautiful thought. But that occurred because he saw the fox running on the top of Harabayas. And it's the same basic idea of dismantling or at least depreciating the value. Here you have a mountain that had served as the center point for Hashem's glory and presence for a combined roughly thousand years. And prior to that, we know that this was considered the birthplace of Adam, Adam Harisha and others, uh, the, the Akedah, many, many occurrences, important occurrences in Jewish history took place here. And here it is seeing a diminished uh, sense of significance, of value, and that of course is very hurtful. And the Gemara concludes by saying, this is a Mishnah. In the, when the month of Av enters, which of course occurred yesterday, we decrease our joy. And so we know that the week of, starting with Rosh Chodesh, there are certain things we stop doing, um, and then it goes further as we get closer and closer to Tisha B'Av, Erev Tisha B'Av, and then Tisha B'Av at night, and then till Chatzos. We know that there are levels by which we, um, which we um, follow to continue to reinforce the notion that things are not all 100%. And we sometimes forget that because we live, most of us live in very comfortable circumstances. We're gonna talk about that more. It's difficult to, I think, really capture, number one, what are we missing? And number two, why do we care? It's a hard thing when things seem to be in good standing. And it seems th things seem to be right and we seem to be able to do what we want. Why does it matter so much? And I think that that's something we really do have to reflect upon. Parenthetically, I will mention that the concept of Mishanichnas of Mematim Besimcha 
It is countered, as we know, by Misha Nechnas Adar Margin Besimcha. And Rav Dessa writes that the same way that in the month of Av we take steps to noticeably decrease the joy that we experience, in the month of Adar we should take steps to noticeably increase the joy till we reach the apex, the crescendo, if you will, during the holiday of Purim. So it's something to think about. Um, in the meantime, let's take a look at the Gemara, same Gemara, Tanis, a little bit later, where it talks specifically about the incident in the desert with the Miraglim. We didn't, it wasn't that long ago that we read the, the Torah portion, um, which described in Parsha Shlach the unfortunate incident of the spies. When 12 of them were sent into the land of Israel, 10 of them returned with a negative report. And it says that following their report, the Ada, the congregation, raised their voice and they cried on that evening. And the Gemara says, Amar Rabbah, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Osa Laila, that evening, Leil Tishabah Apaya, that evening was Tishabah. Amar Lahem HaKadosh Baruch Hashem said to them, Atem Bechisa, Bechia Shalchina, you cried unnecessarily for no reason, Va'ani Kovea Lachem Bechia Lederos. I will establish this evening, this day, as a day of crying for generations. And by the way, we do know that when it comes to the Jewish calendar, you see routinely this notion. It's not just a matter of remembering an event of yesteryear. You know, often in the secular holidays, not to diminish them at all, but they're usually attached to an event. An event, so, so let's call it independence, whatever the event specifically that Thanksgiving commemorates, it's not really the point for the moment, but oftentimes it's sort of a, a peek back in history, reflecting back on a positive time, hopefully, or a day that we utilize to remember a group, let's say Labor Day, to remember the struggles of workers, or Memorial Day to remember the soldiers who have fallen, right? So we sort of earmark a date for the purpose of collective memorization. In the Jewish calendar, it's not, so to speak, a one and done type experience where once upon a time in a land far, far away, you know, going back however long, our ancestors experienced X. And we're sort of trying to capture what that X is, living far away and not really being there. Which, by the way, in my mind, is probably the greatest challenge of the night of Pesach, because we say, Chayav Adam, Lira Sasatzmo, everybody's obligated to see themselves as if he was leaving the land of Egypt, which, again, if you're going to really, if you look at the Maharal, he says the obligation is quite personal, that you have to really, it's not just, I mean, I'm not to de belittle any custom, I think it's great for those who walk around the table or maybe have their, their, their scallions, whatever they might do to reenact the experience, of course, the eating and the leaning, all these things help as well. But really, we have to somehow get ourselves into that as best as we can. But when it comes to Jewish history, we have to realize there's a spiritual, Odessa talks about it, others I think talk about it as well, like a spiritual energy that flows from the heavens specific to certain times of year. Now why those times were chosen? Maybe because of that initial historical experience. Maybe that experience tied into the way Hashem established the calendar from the beginning. I'm not here because I think we'll be spinning our wheels trying to figure that one out. Regardless, once we know that the 15th of Nisan was established as a day of redemption, so it becomes man cheirusenu for all of future history, regardless of how much we can personally connect to what they were dealing with. It's an opportunity for us to be freeing ourselves from whatever shackles, from whatever limitations or burdens or struggles that we might have. And zman cheirusenu, I'm sorry, zman simchasenu, which is sukkahs, which is a time of great joy, is something, yes, of course, we have to think about the Beis HaMikdash, we have to think about what Sukkot is all about. It's really, in my opinion, the official holiday of Jewish history, because it captures the idea that Hashem protected us for an extended period of time, fed us and clothed us, and, and gave us everything that we needed. Imagine what it would be like to feed three million people for 40 years. Imagine going shopping and you know, handling all those. That's quite the challenge. Um, but to imagine the joy that's associated with the, the, the holiday, and then to make that joy your own, and to, per, and to personalize it. So Yom Kippur, for example, we know, coming back for a moment to the issue of breaking the luchos, etc., the Yom Kippur is the day that Moshe Rabbeinu returned with, let me just get my historical facts, but yes, returned with the second set of luchos. He had gone up three times. First time resulted in tragedy, second time resulted in um, Hashem's re return of favor to the Jewish people. The third time was to get that second set of luchos, which Moshe crafted on his own psalacha, right, carved for yourself, and he brought that second set down. He went up on the first day of Elul, 
and came down on Yom Kippur. Which is why the 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul until Yom Kippur have become Yimei Ratzon, have become days of wanting, special days of closeness and proximity, because we had that, not just that initial event, but it sort of became cemented as the day by which the opportunity to do tshuva would be most right and most possible. Doesn't mean you can't do tshuva any day, of course we need to, but there are certain days by which the gates are more open and more ready for us. So when we talk about Tisha B'Av, the starting point of all of the subsequent tragedy took place, and I guess you can make the same argument with regards to the break in the Luchos B'Shavah Sabatamos, but certainly for Tisha B'Av, the Gemara says, since you cried an unnecessary cry, it was a Bechia Shalchina, it was a cry for no reason, as a result, you're gonna be crying a lot. You're gonna be crying, I'll give you, I'll give you what to cry about, which of course is, is, is very sad to think about, but that's really the way the Gemara is presenting it. Now the obvious question that I think bothers, it certainly bothers me, and I'm assuming it bothers most of you as well, is why is it Shalchina? If I was outside of a land, and 12 people who I trusted were sent into that country, and of course, you know, you're on the news nowadays, you're listening to all the reports, right, you're trusting certain people, you're trusting, you know, army uh, experts, you're trusting politicians, possibly, you're trusting others, it depends on which politician, of course, um, this is a nonpartisan presentation, by the way. Um, so you, you, you put your trust in so-called experts. 12 people go in, 10 of them return with a negative report, two of them return with a positive report, right? Who are you gonna believe? Right? We're dealing with this today all the time, right? The war of, of PR, the court of public opinion, right? We know that Israel's struggling terribly in this regard, unfortunately so, despite the clarity by which we see it, most of the world doesn't. Um, and some people that are actually paid a lot of money to get it right clearly can't. But either way, you would think that numbers would typically dictate accuracy. So why would it be that this is considered a b'chiyah shalchinam, a crime that has no reason, no purpose, no value, if we're hearing about these terrible, mighty individuals on the back end of this experience <coughs> that are going to take us and stomp on us like little grasshoppers? So where, where's the shalchinam in all of this? Okay, so I do want to come back to it, but I definitely think that the question needed to be asked. Okay, now it is important to realize that our avoda in all of this, in trying to understand the underlying causes for this destruction, I think is going to help us with what can we do about it, which is how we started, right? You don't want to just simply learn Torah, I mean you do it, but you want to learn it often with an end, with an end point in mind. How can, it, how can I internalize the message and what can I do to make this nine days period um, the most productive and the most positive uh, possible. Okay, so first of all, we need to realize that the problem, and often we get stuck in this, we sort of think about there were bad people or sinful people who lived a long time ago, and because of their <coughs> sinful nature, we're kind of stuck. I will tell you there are religious systems out there, a big, pretty big one actually, that does attribute a lot of the, the reality, for those of you who are familiar with certain uh, ideology and theology, etc., that att that attribute the present to events of the past, specifically with original sin, and the notion of being trapped and being sort of pulled down by this concept. That's not a Jewish belief. Right? We don't believe that anybody sins. Yes, there are certain circumstances that we find ourselves that might have been the outgrowth of certain sins, but we don't believe that we're trapped by them. We believe that we have the ability to do something about it. And the Gemara tells us very clearly, it's a Yerushalmi, call door. Any generation, she'enu nivna, by the way, I'm up to number three on your paper. Kol dor she'enu nivna biyamah, any generation in which the Beis um, HaMikdash was not rebuilt during that time. Ma'alan alav ki'iluhu ha'chariva. It's as if that generation was the one that caused its destruction. So let's realize that it's not somebody else's problem. And we're sort of the unfortunates who came afterwards. It's our problem. And we have the ability to do something about it. So that should be, on the one hand, very comforting. And it also should give us sort of a call for an action. Uh, number two, we have to realize as follows. And this one, I think, is something that I know I struggle with. And I suspect many of us struggle with as well. It's a Gemara and number four in your paper. Kol Hamis Abel al Yerushalayim. Anyone who mourns for Yerushalayim. Zolche v'ro'e v'simchasa will merit to see the joy associated with it. V'she'enu misal ba'a Yerushalayim, but anybody who fails to do so, e'na ro'e v'simchasa. I don't know exactly, I know what the words mean. I don't know exactly the implications of these words, but they're quite scary. 
I remember distinctly uh, when I was in the Mir Yeshiva coming back on the night of Tisha B'Av from the Beis Madrash. And there was a fellow who was, who I knew, I didn't really know him well, um, and he was sitting on the steps right outside of one of the Shtiblachs, <coughs> not far from the Mir main campus. And he was on the steps and he was crying profusely. And of course, I assumed that it was related to Tisha B'Av. Um, and I said to myself, wow, what am I doing Right? What a level that here you have somebody who grew up in Chutz Laaretz, who grew up far removed from what the base of and even if you grew up in Yerushalayim, which of course is very central, right? There's a huge difference between the coastal as beautiful and as holy as it is, and what's behind it, or what's supposed to be behind it. And so to be able to connect on that level requires you know, a real understanding of what was missing and why we want it so badly. But we see in history the fact that the absence or the unwillingness or whatever the term might be for engaging deeply in this outcome ultimately result in people being left behind. So take a look, for example, at number, uh, number five on your paper. This is a Rashi at the beginning of Parshas B'Shalach. And the, Gemara, the, the, the Torah tells us, the chamushim alu b'nei yisome eretz mitzrayim, that the Jews left Egypt chamushim. So Rashi says the first explanation is, ein chamushim ela mezuyan. The, the, the standard definition of, of chamushim is armed. They left with arms, they were prepared for battle, and if they needed to, they were ready. But Rashi continues, and he offers an explanation that should be very uh, sobering and thought-provoking for all of us. One out of every five left the land of Egypt. The other four fifths remained behind, having died during the three days of the plague of darkness. Which means to say that, and Chazal talk about that the, the want was not there. The desire to be part of the Geula was not there. And frankly, that's really what it's all about. A lot of it, we think of it as a punishment, but oftentimes it's really just a mita connected mita. If you want it, it's available to you. If you don't want it, it's not available to you. So we see, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, one of the reasons for Hashem walking away, so to speak, was because we, as a collective entity, made clear that we weren't excited about His presence. We didn't feel that there was enough of a, of, of a reason to, so to speak, keep him around that justified him being part of the Jewish people in an open way. And when the soul of the Beis HaMikdash goes, when the Shekhinah disappears, there's really nothing left. It's just an edifice at that point, which makes it ripe for destruction. So it's a different part of it, and hopefully we'll come back to it. But we need to realize, see, I think about this often. Um, you know, do we, as American Jews, do we, as Western Jews, wherever we might live, assuming for the moment that we live in a comfortable environment where, generally speaking, we are safe, where materially we're in pretty good shape. We have the educational institutions that we need. We have the schools that we need. It seems like our life is in order. We have all of the amenities of living an Orthodox Jewish life, right? How badly do we want this? I'm not asking anyone to answer. And I'm not even sure I can answer it honestly myself. But I do think we need to think of that as part of this whole conversation because ultimately the want is not just, oh, wouldn't it be nice? And we sort of give lip service to the notion of the returning of the Beis HaMikdash and us returning to Eretz Yisrael. Are we ready? And do we really want it? Something to think about. Okay. Now, the good news is, and this really is, I think, very good news. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you want something badly enough, you, you hold on to the thought of getting it back. And when you don't, you sort of forget about it. And there are many examples of this. The most famous one that we're aware of, it's, it's partially want and partially it seems that the way Hashem created the world is that forgetfulness, especially with a loved one, is often associated with um, their presence here in the world. So we know the Rashi tells us that Ein adem tanchumim alachai. If a person is alive, but we just don't know that they're alive, it seems to be. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I've always been bothered by this. I'm not going to answer it. Why Yaakov Avinu didn't take the fact that he was still bothered and still mourning over Yosef as a sign that Yosef was actually alive. I don't, I don't, that part I never got an answer to. But nonetheless, Rashi makes very clear that Yaakov was never comforted, that after years of separation from Yosef, his beloved son, he still was in active mourning. And Rashi tells us that the Savar Shemes, even if you think that the person is not alive, 
But if they are, then this forgetfulness doesn't kick in. When a person is dead, a special decree comes into effect that causes us to forget, not fully, of course, but the, the acuteness of the pain <coughs> is not there. Below Allah, but it doesn't apply to a living. Now, why do I mention that here? Because we're still mourning over a building, mourning over a building that we haven't had for almost 2,000 years. Just give yourselves a moment to think about what I just said. Right? I don't think there's ever been a building in the history of man, in any society, as big and as glorious, whether it did or did not qualify as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There's not a building out there in the society, in the world, that people mourn over. It just doesn't exist. In fact, if you think about it, we look kind of foolish doing so, in a way. On the other hand, we understand that it's not just an edifice. We understand that it's the center of connection. We understand that there's much more than just the building, despite the fact that the building is beautiful and magnificent, and Herod's in particular was of the great wonders of the ancient world, the way that he built out Harabias, and the amount of people that were able to gather there, and the amount that he invested in. Of course, the sad tragedy is it lasted for less, of, less than a century, the Herodian version of it. It took many years to do, and it's only about 40 years or 50 years from there until it was destroyed, which is very sad. But nonetheless, we're looking for that, but the very fact that we continue to think about it, the very fact that it's in our tefillahs every single day, the very fact that we continually reference the desire for the Mashiach to come and for us to be restored in Yerushalayim, in Eretz Yisrael, means that the concept is very much alive. So we have that going for us, and I think that that's important to think about. So now let's take a look at number seven. There's an aleph and a base to number seven. Number seven really captures more so than anything the main ideas, and you're probably familiar with a lot of it, it's Gemara and Yuma. And the Gemara tells us as follows. Mikdash Rishon with Neymar Harav. Why was the first base of Mikdash destroyed? The answer, as many people know, because of the presence of three things, which we'd call three sins, three general miscreant behaviors that were, that were commonplace during that time. How common, I don't know, but common enough. Avodah Zarah, Megillah Arayos, Hashvich Hazdamim, idolatry, adultery, and bloodshed. Those three were, were present there. Aval Mikdash Sheni, but the second base of Mikdash, now take a look at the following word, because I think that they are significant. Shahayu Oskim Batorah Uba Mitzvos, Uba Gemilos Chasadim. They were involved in all the right things. There was Torah, there were mitzvahs, there was chaseh. Mipnei macharav, why was that case of Mikdash destroyed? Answers the Gemara, Mipnei shahay sabo sinas chinam. Because in it, in it, it's interesting, the word bo is interesting, but it was prevalent that there was this issue of sinas chinam, of, we'll call it causeless hatred. And the Gemara teaches us, the Lamedcha comes to teach you, Sheshkula sinas chinam keneget shalash averos, that the sin of causeless hatred is equal to, if you had a scale, just imagine this for a moment, and on one side of the scale I put bloodshed and adultery and idolatry. You can imagine that that scale would drop pretty fast. And then on the other one I, I, I heap on sinas chinam, that would balance the scale. And the Gemara tells us that it would be um, of equal value, and that's ultimately why each base of Mikdash wound up being destroyed. Now, um, before we look at seven bays, let's take a look at number eight for a moment, just to reinforce the point. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the Gemara in Gitin that tells of a story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. The Gemara says, A Kamsa Bar Kamsa, Charov Yushalayim, Jerusalem was destroyed because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Parenthetically, we never meet Kamsa. We only hear about Bar Kamsa and a host. Kamsa was the person who shouldn't have been invited. And there, were a lot of, there was a lot of sectarian issues and violence that was going on in Yerushalayim at that time. Uh, a lot of problems. You had the zealots, the Kanoim, you had the moderates, who were largely the followers of the Talmud Chachamim of the period. And then you had a group called the Friends of Rome, who were the aristocratic elite, who were more assimilated, more inclined to continue Roman presence because they had a good and relative circumstance. So you had this going on in Yerushalayim, and I think that does certainly tie into the issue of sinas chinam, that here you had somebody who was pleading for the sake of not being humiliated to remain and wasn't allowed to do so. This is a more overt example. Now, coming back to um, 
this point for a moment. The Gemara tells us that it's not so simple. 7b, or base. Rabbi Yochum, Rabbi Lazar, the Ami Tarvar, both Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Yochum said together, Rishonim Shenizgalu Avonam, the earlier ones whose sins were revealed. Niskala Kitsan, their end was also revealed, meaning to say the end of the exile. And there are two different prophecies, one in Yirmiyahu, one in Daniel, which each talk about a 70 year period by which Yerushalayim would be restored, the Beis Amikdash rebuilt. It's actually two different sets of 70 years, they overlap by about 18 years. So the total period is 88 years. Mm -hmm. Different conversation, take a look at Rashi, the first Pasuk of Sefer Ezra, where Rashi details the two sets of 70, one going from Galus Yechania, which was the exile by which most of the elite of the Jewish nation were exiled prior to the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, and on the, on the back end of it was when the Jews started to return during the period of Zerubbabel and Yehoshua Kohen Gadol. And then you had 18 years after that, actually there were three Galos. There was uh, Galos um, Yehoyakim, Yehoyachin, and eventually Tzidkiyahu. That spanned 18 years. So the front end, parallel to the front end of the return, which was Zerubbabel at the time of the declaration of Koresh, of Cyrus, which you find at the beginning of Sefer Ezra. 18 years later is when the Beis HaMikdash was finally completed. They had been given permission from Dariyavesh, a different king, to finish the job. So it's not a definitive 1.1 to 0.270 years. There are two sets of 70, of which 52 years overlap, just for historical purposes. But either way, what we're dealing with over here is they knew, they had a very clear message, they had reason to believe that their Gullahs, their exile, would be finite, and they would be returning in short order, and in fact, that's what happened. However, the second group, when it came to Bayashini, it says as follows, Aharonim, at the end of the long, Shalom is Gala Avonim, the latter ones whose sins were not revealed, Lon is Gala Kitzim, and I say revealed, I, I think revealed means open, right? When you talk about relationships, those tend to be more um, internal. They tend to be more concealed. Right? How I really think about you, um, nothing personal, of course, but how I really think about you is, is something I keep to myself, unless, of course, I'm rash enough to share it with you or make it evident through my behaviors. But bloodshed and idolatry and, and adultery, those are more open sins. So that's pretty, pretty clear. So where the sin was more um, exposed, the outcome was also more clear. But where the sin was concealed, so was the end point, and we still don't know what that end point is going to be. Amar Rabbi Yochum, but it's more than that. Tovat Siporna Shal Yishonim, the fingernails, which of course is probably the least valuable part of our anatomy. The fingernails of the earlier ones were greater than, more valuable than, Mikreso, the abdomen, Shal Acharona. The abdomen is really where, I mean the brain too, but, but that's really where everything lies in terms of our ability to live, etc. Amar Le Rish Lakish, Rish Lakish, and Adarabah, just the opposite, on the contrary. Acharot and Madifi, the later ones were greater. Alpagat the Ikashiva Machias, Kaaski Torah. Even though they were in exile, and largely they were, whether Babylonian or Greek or, per, or uh, uh, Persian, I'm sorry, during Baishani it was Persian, and then Greek, and then Roman, very little autonomy. Only during the period of the Hashmonaim did they experience any autonomy, but for about three quarters of the time they were under foreign hegemony. Okay? But even so, they managed to learn Torah. So the later ones were greater. That's Rish Lakish. Amar Lai, Sir Rabbi Yochanan responded, Bira Tochilach, let the building be the proof. Shechazor Lavishonim, Belo Chazor Lacharonim. The building, in the first case, was returned, whereas the second one's building was still not restored. So the obvious question that I think we have to ask ourselves, considering where things are um, in, in our conversation thus far is, you know, how is it possible, coming back to the scale analogy, that you could put Sinas Chinam on one side, and that's going to weigh against the other three. We all know there's a concept in Judaism called Yahari Val Yavor. Yahari Val Yavor means that there are certain sins which are so foundational to our faith that you must allow yourself to be killed rather than to commit that, that sin. And these three are the three. And yet we have sin asinam, which we recognize to be bad. We're not, we're not condoning it in any way. Yet at the same time, I don't think if you stopped any Jew on the street and said, what's the worst sins out there, they would put sinas chinam in that conversation. So how is it possible that sinas chinam can measure up with the other three? It doesn't seem to be correct. And the other question is, how do we deal with it? 
So I'm going to, you know, regardless of whether it's worse, not worse, we still have that as our problem. How are we going to try to solve it? So I'd like to suggest a couple of things. First of all, sinas chinam, it may not be on the individual level that it's worse than the other averos. But sometimes you have to think about the collective fabric of community and what our behaviors and our thoughts do to either maintain it and preserve it and build it or perhaps to the opposite. Let me give you an example. Take a look at the Rashi that you see for number nine. It's a Rashi at the end of Parshas Noah, and it's a Rashi that you'll find in the story of the Dor HaFlaga, which was the generation of disbursement. You're probably familiar that at the end of Parshas Noah, there's an account of a group of individuals, a large section of society, led by the King Nimrod, who uh, rebelled against God, which of course is interesting, Noah is still alive at the time. People who were actually on the Teva are still there. And yet they're waging war with God and they're claiming different things such as every 1600 plus years the sky has a fundamental mechanical breakdown. So we're going to build these support towers that are going to keep the sky from falling down again. Like Chicken Little in its ancestral form. All right, And it sounds ridiculous. Here you have live witnesses, right? CNN reporting live from the flood. And here you have you know, all the evidence you need, people who literally experienced it firsthand. Shame is alive at the time of Avraham. Avraham, by the way, is alive at this time. So all the people you would need to tell you to the contrary are there. And yet, here you have a whole group of individuals who are fighting against Hashem directly, Depends on what you say. Achadim means it could be anything from unified to having a common message against the one, the singular one, which refers to Hashem. Any explanation of Rashi you want to utilize. The question, though, is let's look at the consequence that they received. Because earlier in the Parsha, we encounter the Dor Hamabu. The Torah tells us, at least explicitly, the only sin that is mentioned clearly is the sin of Hamas, which Rashi defines as guessing, as stealing. And yet the entire world was destroyed, with the exception of Noah and his family. And yet we have a sin later on in the Parsha where they're fighting against God directly. They're defying his existence, they're challenging his authority, whatever you want to say was the issue. And yet, what does Hashem do to them? He turns them into you know, a poor communicators and confuses everyone. By the way, parenthetically, the word, I'm pretty sure that I'm right here, etymologically, the word Babel which we use to mean to talk nonsense, comes from the word Babel, which is the location of this incident. And I believe that the two are deeply connected. But either way, Mivol Baal needs to be confused. It certainly is connected. Anyway, so here you have a sin of, of massive proportion, and yet the consequence seems to be just a little slap on the wrist. Right? Doesn't seem to make sense. Coming back to our connection to modern day times, you start to see the, the, the parallels here. So Rashi asks the obvious question based on Chazal. Which one is worse? Shaldor HaMavu or Shaldor HaFlaga? Elu Pashtu Yad Ve'ikr. The earlier ones, they never defied God directly. The Elu Pashtu Yad Ve'ikr Lehilachim Bo. Yet the latter group wanted to fight a Kaddish Baruch Hu directly. The Elu Nishtafu Ve'elu Lo Nefti Menol. The first group were drowned. The second were not destroyed. Ela Shaldor HaMavu Hayu Gazlonim. They were thieves. The Haisa Mariva Benehem. And there was fighting going on between them. Lakach Nehavdu. That's why they were destroyed. The Elu Hayu Noahgin Ahava Bereus Benehem. The latter ones were fully unified. They were loving, they were kind to each other. They were in common um, purpose with one another. Shenemar, as it says, Safa Echod Achas Udvar Machodim. That their words were one and their language was one. It goes to teach you just how bad um, tension and disagreement is and how powerful peace can be. That even when we're not right, even when we're not 100%, even when our, when our deeds are individually lacking, the power of community can bring not only all of us together, but fill in the gaps. That's why we're Makbid, for example, we're particular to try to daven in a communal fashion. Because we can compensate for each other's defects and present to Hashem one unified message that ultimately will, will resonate more profoundly in, the, in, in Shemayim. 
Okay, so that idea, we see this with David, we see this with Ahav, where David HaMelech was a great tzaddik, yet he lost many battles. Ahav was a terrible Russia, yet he won every time. And, and Chazamik, the same analogy. David's time was more strife, Ahav was more unification, despite the evil agenda of that period of time. And so therefore, one suggestion I'd like to make is that Sinas Chinam, fundamentally, what it does is it undercuts the very fabric of who we are, how we see each other, how we relate, and how we support one another. When it's about identifying, we're going to come back to this, hopefully we'll be able to in the time that we have. When, when we spend more time or too much time focusing on distinctions, I'm not to say that there aren't reasons to draw your line in the sand. I'm not saying there aren't values that you have to um, stand for, even though it can be painful to go against somebody else from Kuala Yisrael who you feel really doesn't represent Hashem's agenda. I'm not, I'm not here to get into that level of, of detail, but I can say, and I think all of us would feel similarly, that if there are going to be any silver linings out of the gray clouds that are hovering over us, one of the most powerful ones that have come forth from the time of the abductions moving forward has been the issue of Achtos, has been the fact that we've come together, has been the notion that we've been able to see beyond the externalities and some of the other variables that may you know, distinguish us in political or religious debate and brings us together for a common cause that supersedes all of those distinctions. And that's where I think a lot of sinas chinam really gets at us because we're too focused on not what's, what do I have, and we're going to come back to this, and you know, why do I love you just for who you are, because everybody deserves that despite the parts that we might not agree with. And we get stuck on because you are there, therefore I'm going to remain here. And it sort of keeps us apart. Another idea, and this comes back to I think what we were saying just a moment ago with regards to the underlying motivations here. Where if Desler distinguishes between um, the earlier sins, which were Yetzirah driven, and the later sins, which we're going to come back to in a moment. Parenthetically, I want to tell you a fascinating story. Uh, the Gemara talks about the, the wicked king Menashe. You might be familiar, Menashe was one of the Judean kings. He was the son of Chizkiyahu. Chizkiyahu was one of the greatest kings in Jewish history, and actually didn't want to have any children because he had a prophecy that he'd have this child. And Chizkiyahu was credited for not only building a Torah infrastructure, but that the children knew all the laws of Tumah and Tahara, unbelievable amount of learning. Menashe undid it all, and really was the king by which the slippery slope began to um, develop, which ultimately resulted in the destruction. The only king that sort of stemmed the tide for a period was Yoshiyahu, which was Menashe's grandson. Anyway, Rav Ashi, who was the great Amora, on the tail end of the Amorite period, the one credited, Ravina and, and Ravashi, are credited with the editing, the organization, and the eventual conclusion, if you will, of the Talmud Bavli. He once made a disparaging comment about Menashe in the Shir, referring to him sort of as a colleague. Menashe appears to him in a dream, asks him a halachic question, associated with bread and how you cut it, whatever it might be. Ravashi doesn't know the answer, poses it back to Menashe, Menashe gives him the pshat. He gives him the halach, excuse me. So Ravashi says, if you're so knowledgeable in halacha, how could you have done what's recorded in the, in the Navi? So Menashe says a fascinating analogy. Back then they wore these long, I don't know they call them togas or whatever it is, um, certainly not the pants of today. And he said, back then we wore exceedingly long ones so that when the urge for idolatry would seize us, we would stumble upon our clothing in our quest to do the Avera. If you were alive at our time, you would elevate yours to make a proverbial mini version, and you would dart off to do the sin. Meaning to say, you have no idea of the level of Yitzhahara. And by the way, we know that the Yitzhahara Yitzhah Tov parallel is always in place, because otherwise you don't have the Chiva, you don't have freedom of choice. So while there was prophecy, while there was open divine revelation, there needed to be a counterbalance a negative aspect, a spiritual energy that would pull us away from Hashem, and that was, the, 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 uh, that was idolatry, that was the, the Yetzirah for Avod Sarah. And it was so strong that eventually Chazal, in the time of the Anshe Knesset Gedola, davened for it to disappear, because people weren't able to survive. And as a result, prophecy disappears as well. Right? It's not coincidental that that's happening at the same time. So here you had a situation where the Yetzirah is extremely strong. Okay, take a look, for example, at number 10, because number 10 tells us that because of this powerful, idolatrous urge, we had other urges as well. Everybody knew idolatry had no substance. The only reason that they 
pursued it was because it opened other doors for them. It made arios, it made adultery more possible. And we know, by the way, that idolatrous uh, societies of yesteryear, the two went hand in hand. But where you had strong polytheistic, paganistic behaviors religiously, you also, in the houses of worship, had all sorts of sexual promiscuity and things like that as well. The two go hand in hand. Because when you have a society in which you can live and let live, there is no real sense of schar v'onesh. It's one of the core issues with Tzadok and Baisus, who were the students of Antinus and Soko, where they veered, they sort of adopted this Greek concept that there is no accountability. Right? Life without accountability can be pretty sweet. Unless, of course, you sort of just pursue your, your pleasures and then you're left with nothingness which is, I think, how the world sort of rebounded into Christianity and wanting some sense of meaning and purpose. And that's sort of the direction we've moved in. But that was a very strong component in all of this. And so when you're talking about a Yitzhahara, Yitzhahara is something that you enjoy, you're excited about it, you do it, whatever the it might be, and then it's over. So you go to a restaurant, you've got a beautiful uh, plate put in front of you of the most succulent steak, whatever you might like, that you're going to enjoy. At some point, you're done, right? Yitzhahara is over. You've satisfied yourself, you're ready to go home. It's not there anymore. But an hour ago, that Yetzirah was pretty strong. If a person engages in other behaviors, uh, promis promiscuity, things like that, there's a moment of great excitement, so to speak, and then of course it starts to wane at a later point. And therefore, you're talking about a Yetzirah that's more fleeting, and therefore the consequence, you could argue, would be more fleeting as well, and it's external. Meaning to say, the people, as the Gemara tells us, were in fact greater during the earlier period, right? The, 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 the fingernails of the earlier generations were greater than the abdomens of the later. That's not, you know, that's not just talk. That's a real understanding of the level of greatness of that earlier generation. So how is it possible that they did what they did? Because the Yitzhahara of their time was so strong. So certainly, if you look at them at face value, you cannot compare murder to baseless hatred. But if you understand the motivation, if you understand the drive, if you understand the compelling sense, I'm not to say that they were innocent and that they had no possibility of controlling it, otherwise they probably wouldn't have been punished at all. They were punished. They did do something wrong. They are viewed as sinners. But the level of sin for them to do it, as opposed to, let's say, for us to do it, would be very different. Whereas when it comes to Bayeshenim, it comes to Sin Aschinam, Sin Aschinam is a defect on the interior part of ourselves. There's nothing about another person fundamentally, 99 times out of 100, that would make me want to hate them or make me want to be envious of them. If we believe, and this is, by the way, an interesting aside, where we think about the Decalogue, the Aserus, the Dibros, the Ten Commandments, and you say, these are really it. Right? These are of the most important mitzvahs. Chazal actually had a part of davening, or maybe we're going to have a part of davening, included at the beginning. We didn't do so because they didn't want everyone to say, that's all there is. And so it's not included in our tefillah. But if you look at them, some of them seem to be really foundational. I am Hashem your God, you shall have no other. Shabbos, murder. And then you have something at the very end which seems to be uh, a bad fit, so to speak, and that is, Losachna, you shall not covet. First of all, how can you say I can't covet? It's a human impulse, right? We're just naturally inclined to wanting what other people have. And even if we could somehow deal with that, why does it belong in this list? And I think the answer to that, if you understand the Ibn Ezra, who says, Lo Sakmod is based on the notion that I have what I need to do the job that I'm here to do. We sometimes think that we're all here to do the same job. And so we get upset when we realize that other people have different tools than we have. But if we realize that every person looks different, every person has different qualities, every diff person has different circumstances, we all have our proverbial pekalach, we have that as our unique composition of who we are, then we understand that Hashem gave us all the specific tools that we have for the outcome that we're supposed to fulfill. If you think in those terms, then you really should not be jealous, the same way that a carpenter wouldn't be jealous of an electrician for having different tools, because he has a different job. And for me to do the job that I have, which is to build beautiful bookshelves, I don't need the special wires that the electrician might have. And conversely, the saws that the carpenter has doesn't appeal to the electrician because it won't do him any good in the context of the work that he has to achieve. And so we don't have that structure. We don't think of ourselves as electricians versus plumbers or whatever. And so it's harder for us, but nonetheless, it's the same idea. So the core concept here then is, do we really appreciate, are we really deep down um, willing and able to recognize, A, that there is a divine plan specific to me, 
that Hashem put me in this world for a particular purpose, and if I have what I need, and if I'm fully satisfied in that regard, then there really is no place for envy of others. So it doesn't then boil down to simply a matter of, let's call it imperfection of character, which is a piece of it, no question, but it's a faith issue as well. It's a matter of fundamentally, do I believe that what I have is what I need? It's a matter of saying, this person out there is somebody who can also advance Hashem's will, not somebody who's going to get in my way. So Rabbeinu Yona, we talk about this when it comes to the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, this notion that you know, when you see somebody else, you look at them with a narrow eye, and you see them as somehow in your way, you want to be the very best, you want to be recognized, because the external recognition is what motivates you, as being the very best, then somebody else who's also very good is competition. And I look at competition with a negative eye. But if I see he's a piece of this mission, and she's a piece of this mission, and all of us need to work together, and all of us need to, uh, to take and utilize all of the positive qualities that we have, all the characteristics, all the energies, all the qualities, etc., and direct them towards that positive outcome, then we're really forwarding Hashem's agenda rather than forwarding our agenda. Because if it's our agenda, Hashem says, I'm out of here. I have no place in a building, in a society which is self-indulgent, which is focused on what's good for me. It's using Hashem. It's using Hashem. We see this in Pirkei Avos as well. It's using Hashem for personal gain. And there are, you can imagine such a concept. I'm going to gain recognition and appreciation because I learn so much, because I do so much chesed. And unfortunately, we have to ask ourselves sometimes, what's driving the mitzvahs that we do? So all of it, I think, speaks to that same point. If our motivation is positive, if we are unified in our thinking, if we recognize that we need everybody to help advance Hashem's agenda, then there really isn't a place for sinna, there isn't a place for hatred. Because we recognize and we appreciate that all of us work together. So if what's underlying our problems are taiva, taiva meaning desires, Tightness will go away at a certain period of time. As bad as the action was at the moment, we're not fundamentally attached to it. But if what's driving us is gaiva, which is arrogance, if what's driving us is sinna, which is anger, and a lack of appreciation, that doesn't go away. Because we're still stuck in a mindset of what's in it for me, and how am I going to be better for it. And that, of course, can be self-perpetuating, because what's going to cause it to stop? So in conclusion, Looking at the time, I think we're pretty much where we needed to be. In conclusion, and we asked the question at the very beginning, so we're going to talk about the nine days, and we're going to talk about the causes. How does it relate to us, and perhaps specifically, how does it connect to the time in which we find ourselves right now? So I would suggest that the answers that we've talked about until now are that you know, we today, more than, than any other time, have to be able to reflect on our own motivations, we have to understand that there are things out there that are greater than just us as individuals. There's a base amikdash to rebuild. We want to be part of that. And in order to be part of that, we need to recognize that the ultimate macro level goal in all of this is the advancement of Hashem's will in this world, the recognition of Hashem the way we define Hashem, as a loving God who believes in life, who believes in, 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 in unity, who believes in positive energy and positive action, Right? That's the end goal in all of this. It's not my ability to somehow step forward and, and get recognition in the context of where we are today with my affluence or with my prestige or with my social recognition, whatever that might look like. We need to be able to say, A, I'm here for a reason. I have everything I need to be able to succeed. But the goal in all of it is to see beyond the moment. The goal in all of it is to see the bigger picture. And then with that, we can start to <clears throat> focus our energies and, by the way, really start to feel good about it. Because there is, at the end, no lasting fulfillment with materialistic outcomes. Right? You have it, you get the latest toy, the latest gadget, the latest vehicle, whatever it might be. You enjoy it, and of course you still enjoy it while you have it, but that excitement is at the very beginning, and then it goes down from there. On the other hand, when your motivation is external, when you're looking to direct your energies towards giving, towards positivity, towards building, then you continue to build in, within yourself, your happiness, your excitement, your energy gets higher and higher, stronger and stronger because you know you're building towards something bigger than yourself. And deep down, I think we all know that that's really the outcome here. 
And so if we can, each in our own way, um, undertake to spend a few minutes to think about the topic that we discussed this morning. I'm sure you have many other things to think about today and, and beyond as well. But if you can take a few minutes to think about what is motivating you in all of this and how can I make a difference, I think the answer is think from the inside out. Think where we want to go. Think about the bigger picture and how we can be a piece. And it's only a small piece, but every small piece makes a difference. How can we make a positive contribution towards that end goal so that hopefully this year already, the Tisha B'Av that we experience is the day of joy that the Gemara describes rather than the day of sorrow. And hopefully we will all see the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash speedily in our day.